You are going to get four of us. We are going to get it all through in uh, 30 minutes. And the reason is that this actually is a very broad-reaching project, and no one of us uh, did one bit of it. The original idea really comes from Simon, and then it was such a good idea that all of us hijacked it, because we all wanted to be able to say we spoke at CERN. Um, so let's talk a bit about AAP. It's a processor design, but it's not designed for the usual reasons you design a processor. And it was prompted by this comment. It's not actually anonymous. I know who said it, but I'm not going to name and humiliate him here. Uh, and it says, as we all know, integers are either 32 bits or 64 bits. And we spend a lot of time in the embedded world, and they're most definitely uh, not always 32 or 64 bits. And that actually is someone who works a lot on LLVM. And LLVM has historically rather believed that integers are always at least 32 bits. And we do a lot of work. If you want LLVM for an embedded processor, small, deeply embedded processor, we are the only company you can go to in the world to get that as a, uh, as a commercial product. Um, and if you look at LLVM, there are about 12 architectures in LLVM. Only one of those is not 32 or 64 bit. That's the MSP430, and though it's 16 bit, it's pure risk, lots of registers, standard von Neumann architecture. So, there's no Harvard architectures, there's no word addressed architectures, and the problem we have is, though we develop compilers for such architectures, we're quite often developing compilers before products are announced, so we can't go and talk and we can't push them upstream because they're all currently secret. And when we talk to our customers, they've got this big worry. They're developing this compiler. There's no architecture like it in LLVM, so LLVM may change under their feet just as they're about to release their tool and their compiler. So what they really want is a processor that we can push upstream that has all the features that they may need. So AAP is a reference design for LLVM that has all the features that cause real grief from a compiler perspective in deeply embedded architectures. It is, from a compiler perspective, the architecture from hell. Um, but by putting it into LLVM, we want to make sure that LLVM can compile architectures no matter where they come from. Um, now, what became clear was, if we're going to push it upstream, it can't just be pure you know, simulated architecture. We've actually got to prove it, it could be real. So we need an FPGA implementation. So what you're going to get today is you're going to get me talking a little bit about AAP. You're going to get Dan talking about the very first implementation of AAP on an FPGA. Um, and I think Dan will probably be the youngest ever speaker at uh, an Orconf meeting. And uh, then lastly, uh, Simon and Ed will talk about the real meat, and I think even though this is a hardware conference, it's very relevant, about why this causes such problems for LLVM, and they'll look a bit at the LLVM issues, why they're a problem, and why they're getting fixed. Um, so here is uh, AAP. Um, it uh, is a Harvard architecture. It has word address code memory. It has byte addressed uh, data memory. Um, it's got a variable number of registers um, configurable because we actually want to experiment with what happens if I haven't got any very many registers. And LLVM really does assume you've got about 16 registers, um, general purpose ones. Um, and it's, it's got an ALU. It's, it's registers to register operations, um, so it looks a bit like a risk from a, uh, an ALU point of view, but it, it's not a uniform memory at all. And indeed, Conceptually, it can have more than one code memory, more than one uh, uh, data memory, and those are certainly architectures that, from some security perspectives, people are quite interested in. So, um, notice that um, it's got 24-bit of code memory, uh, but it's got 16-bit registers and 16-bit data, so the pointer doesn't fit into an integer, and you'd be surprised how much stuff assumes that's not the case. Um, it's got uh, RISC-V type instruction encoding, 16, 32, 48 bits, so we can expand it as much as we like. I would say the encoding's been done by me as a software engineer, and it's not easy to do in hardware, um, so it's, it's never going to be a small chip when we make it. The registers I've talked about, and the FPGA implementation 
is a student implementation. It's very simple, and Van will talk about it in a bit more detail, but it's a proof of concept. You can actually run this on silicon as well as in simulation. And the whole point is, of course, it's got an LLVM toolchain. Um, so where are we? The outline ISA is published, um, and indeed it was updated on Friday, so every instruction is documented. But we're still working through some details, and we're getting quite good feedback from people who say, ah, this causes me a real problem in my compiler. Can you put this horrible thing in your design to make your compiler even more useful? So we're adding horrible things to it. And if you've got some horrible things you want to add, just let Simon know. Um, so the initial implementation runs on a TerraSIC D0 Nano. Um, it's simple, non-pipelined. It needs a bit of polishing, um, but it does work. And there's a draft application note which is just being reviewed at the moment where Dan talks about his work over the summer doing this. Uh, the simulator's in GitHub, the LLVM tool chain is being submitted upstream uh, and it's going through the review process. And, oh yeah, there we are, there's the specification, it's an endocosm application note, free of course. And now, over to Dan. Hi, I'm Dan. I'm currently studying towards A-levels at Brock, so I've just finished GCSEs, I'm 16. Um, and over the summer I was tasked with implementing AAP. It was a brilliant experience and I get to be here. Um, yeah, the implementation is in Verilog. I started over the summer with only two weeks experience. And, yeah, as with any big project, we started on a whiteboard. <laughs> and loads of different diagrams. Um, this is what we concluded on. A uh, basic fetch module that is got a program counter in as well, which will read from the instruction memory, send it over to the code, and in execute, you read and write from either memory or both occasionally. Um, well, I did that, and then I needed to make something to actually write to it. So I had to make, or I, we took inspiration from the UART um, Arduino and stole the UART from the chip hack that Embercosm ran in May last year to help debug, and then you can send and read information from all of the memories. And then I had to go about debugging it all, which is quite hard. So I had to, you can just about see all these different lines, and they're all the different values of each wire and register in my processor. I had to go through all those and see if they were lined up properly. And I also used a Magic Energy Management Board as a oscilloscope to help debug outputs on the UR. And my application note is nearly done. It will be posted soonish. I think that's over to you. So I'd like to talk about the, some of the particular issues that we found with LLVM that essentially we tried to create the architecture for, from hell for. So um, in many ways, C thinks our hardware is very weird. Um, firstly, um, you know, you sort of assume that pointers are generally the same size for anything, but when your pointer, when pointers to functions aren't the same size as your pointers to variables, how do you store them? How do you make function pointers work? Um, these, in, you know, this in particular, um, there's who's familiar with the embedded C extension? 
<coughs> so um, one of the things that this um, allows you to specify uh, multiple address spaces. So you can say that I have this memory here that's um, accessible by 16-bit pointers, and this memory over here that's accessible by 32. Which seems like, you know, the sort of thing would be perfect for this. We just say that our functions live in this uh, special 24-bit address space. The problem with that is that um, to see functions are not objects, they're something different, and therefore they have to live in the default address space. Therefore, they must have short pointers, and when implementing your compiler, you have to add all sorts of workarounds to, go, to satisfy the compiler's thoughts that this is a 16-bit pointer. If you do pointer arithmetic on it for some reason, things work, but when you want to use the pointer, the eight bits that the compiler forgot about just magically appear. Um, the other thing is, well, the second thing is that for LLVM in particular, it does register allocation really, really late. And a lot of the optimizations assume that I've got plenty of registers, so we can have as many variables as you want live at once. Which means you end up with code that goes, oh, well, I've got about 24 variables to fit into four registers. So there's a lot of memory moves to and from registers. Um, the problem gets even worse if you have um, operations in your, if you have instructions in your CPU where you can do ALU operations directly on memory. Um, LLVM at the moment uh, goes, oh, well, doing things on register is probably cheaper, so let's just spill something to the stack, copy another value in, and then spill it back again, load the, initial, the first value back in. Which is good, apart from, you know, we have these operations where you can add a value that's directly on the stack, why not do that instead? And thirdly, um, so for Again, those not familiar with embedded C, you sort of put um, a specifier before your type to say this lives in this special address space. Um, a lot of LLVM assumes that all pointers are the same. It's designed to allow different size pointers. This is just part of the implementation that, because there hasn't been, hasn't been an architecture like this that's particularly weird, no one has tried to exercise it before. So we're finding all sorts of bugs that, oh, I assume that, you know, I can use this pointer, I can do something with it, and it's the size of the default pointer. Oh, it's not, let's, then the compiler blows up. So with AAP1, these are the three things that we've tried to um, solve upstream, because um, in particular for our customers, these are probably the most important ones because if we don't get this right, we produce horrible, horrible code. Um, and now I'd like to hand over to Ed for what the architecture from Hell version 2 looks like. Yes, um, so at the moment, uh, the architecture is reasonably sane. Um, we've generally got a very risk architecture and it looks quite sensible. Um, however, we want to start looking at all the features we want to add and we're looking for inputs as well. If anyone's got some quite horrible features that they keep seeing crop up, um, they'd like us to have a look at. Um, we'd be quite interested in trying it as well. So I've already mentioned sort of the difficulties with uh, having very restricted register sets um, and that, that seems to cause all kinds of issues in LPM. Um, one thing we're going to play with um, oh, the 24-bit version of the instructions will be um, sort of indivisible, non-power to register sizes. Um, LVM have, generally has this view that you can divide, well, if you can't handle a, a given value, you can split it up in, nicely into other values and then handle them and put it back together. Um, uh, this doesn't really work if you can't actually divide things up at all. Um, we want to see what happens when you start, start doing that. Um, I believe the architecture at the moment doesn't have any direct memory operations in it. Um, so we'll probably try and have that just to see what sort of, um, <coughs> sort of trade-off that gives us and what sort of heuristics you have to introduce into the compiler to make that work uh, properly. Um, um, one thing we did have someone mention before, um, 
and this was sort of DSP stuff and having them having fixed point instructions. Um, these LVM doesn't have any sort of internal representation of the fixed point instructions. Um, the general sanctioned way of doing this seems to be have custom uh, custom intrinsics or custom code basically throughout the compiler, um, which then just gets turned into into code or um, or then custom loaded by the uh, compiler for that specific architecture. Um, this has the downside that you're kind of going to miss out on a lot of the nice optimizations you get with the normal sort of integer flow. Um, so it would be interesting to see if that would work. Um, I have not, I know that the, that's been mentioned on the mailing list before and um, got shot down quite badly. So um, it, it, it may not be something we can generically um, add into the compiler. Um, one of the things is, as well as sort of having a variable number of registers, it's also par parameterizing the ABI. Um, so uh, parameterizing it based on the number of registers, what do you do, what's coolly saved, what's cool as saved. Um, can, what happens when you change your calling convention and how do you handle uh, the infrastructure around such as libraries um, if you've got a sort of unlimited number of different ABIs how do you do sort of uh, multiple libraries for, to handle those different ABIs um, we also looked at um, I'm one of the ones probably more in terms of our expertise is generating zero overhead loops um, we need some, some mechanism to do that um, I believe most of it's quite um, architecture specific in the, uh, in the LVM, so it'd be interesting to see if there's something generic that can be done there. Um, and another one which we, we've had to handle with a customer, uh, just when your functions live in, or when you have functions which can live in different address spaces, then how do you, uh, and with different calling conventions um, and different sized uh, or different sized address spaces, so you may have one function pointer which is much bigger than another, how do you then handle that case when the C standard doesn't really give you a way of handling it? Um, for all of these, um, there's some other ones in there, sort of in our very, very sketchy whiteboard drawings. Um, but sort of, uh, we want to investigate sort of generic solutions for all of these where possible. Um, if it's something we can't put into LVM itself, then it's, it's nice to solve the problem, just so that we can demonstrate that we can solve the problem, that it can be done with LVM as well. And I think that's the conclusion of, of what we've got with AEP2. Yep, thank you. That um, uh, if you have a small number of registers, that the uh, compiler does not optimize it, optimize the code in a very good way. Um, I wanted to know if there is a, if it, that's the case also for the regular GCC, and uh, if there is a, any possibility or solution to the problem at all. Uh, if uh, it's basically the only solution is to have a different. Uh, either in that it must be implemented in a specific way or anything else? The answer is that both GCC and LLVM are children of the risk revolution and assume you have lots of registers, so neither of them does a particularly good job. Oh, sorry, GCC. GCC is not a children of the revolution. Okay, there's a, uh, we, can, we can have the philosophical discussion, but GCC, whether it was a child or it has been taken over by, assumes it has plenty of registers there and when we have difficult architectures it's because of the shortage of registers. Um, we're specifically trying to solve it for LLVM because there's, there's a case for the fact that GCC has 40 architectures in it on the whole it tends to hit most of the travel points one way or another. Hi, um, when I was building a 16-bit processor one of the things I ran into with um, uh, LCC was doing register pairs for handling longer data types. <laughs> Is there reasonable support for that in LLVM and the I'd say LLVM is reasonably good at handling sort of if you need to pair up registers. And it's, it, it could do better. And I, mean, I think a lot of the architectures which are in there don't 
need to quite a lot of the time. So 